So welcome to the podcast, Jamie. It's a pleasure to have you today. Hi, Rob. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Thanks for spending your time with us. I appreciate it. I know you're a busy man. Um, but for those who haven't come across you before, give us a bit of an insight into how did you fall in love with sport as a young kid and how has that developed into the, the many different roles you have today? Yeah, I, I, mine's probably a pretty familiar story, really, with, with other people. I, I grew up in a very sporty family. Um, my mum and dad uh, were both heavily into sport. My dad played football at a decent level, not, not professionally, but a good level. So from a young age, I was going along and watching him on the sidelines and, and playing, you know, with all the other kids and the, the other dads and things. And my mum was, was really into sport. She used to work at a football club and was in and around that. For, for, so it was, it was a natural progression, really, that I was involved in particularly football, but other sports as well. And then I, I guess as I grew up, nothing ever came close to it. Nothing else took my attention like, like sport did from, from a, from a enjoyment perspective, but also what it gives me from other aspects, you know, socially, the majority, the vast majority of my friends I've met through sport in one way or another. Um, it was challenging, you know, every perspective possible. I think sport offers so much and I've not just never found anything that's come close to taking my attention away from it. So, um, I, I, <laughs> I found out pretty quickly that I was never going to earn a career out of it. So, the next best thing is working in it as a support staff. That's where I went and, and you know, PE and, and then into kind of A-levels and onto university was, was always sport related topics. And then I ended up at Liverpool John Moores doing the science and football course. And I graduated from there with, with that kind of dawning feeling of, well, what am I going to do now? You know, there is nowhere else to go in terms of, of academia. I could, you know, could have done a master's and things, but I, I'm ready for a break then. And I, and I wrote a letter to, every commutable uh, club within my area. So anywhere that was feasible for me to get to, I wrote a letter to them and said, can I come along and, and just get involved? And um, Barnsley Football Club got in touch and I went along and I did a session, was watched by the, the staff there. And then they said, right, okay, come on in two or three times a week. And it was completely voluntary. Obviously there's you know, this discussion about voluntary work now, whether it should happen or not. But for me, it was invaluable. It got my foot in the door and I did. I did probably three or four months completely voluntary and then it went to expenses and then you started getting a bit more money from it. And, um, and then it ended up just progressing from there. Um, one of the age group coaches said, well, we need someone to teach this uh, BTEC course uh, or some hours a week. So I ended up going into that and then I've been in teaching ever since. And that's probably where my career is, is education from FE and, and uh, higher education uh, environments. But I've tried because my passion is sport. I've tried to remain active as a coach throughout. Um, you know, I've coached since I was at college, seventeen in multi sports, and then football, and then and now more recently S and C. So, I've always been a coach at heart, but my career has predominantly been funded by teaching, teaching, and education. So, mm. that's really interesting. Your point about writing letters reminds me actually. When I was fifteen, I did the same thing, but from Perth, Western Australia. I wrote to every football league club I could find in London uh, to get a trial, yeah. and you know, as you'd expect, not many came back. But actually, ended up having trials with Wimbledon at the time before they became MK Dons yeah. and, and Chelsea. But it shows you that you know, if people are desperate to get an opportunity, you'll, you'll do these things. Whereas a lot of people don't even think to do that these days, do they? No, I mean, it, I, it's a funny story, really, how I did it. It was my dad's idea at the time, and we sent out a letter, and I must have sent out probably between 50 and 100 letters. I sent out loads, just printed them. And my dad said, you need to be different because there's obviously loads of people doing the same thing. And he'd read somewhere, and it's a bit cheesy, but it worked, um, stick a Kit Kat in each envelope. So just, you know, the two-finger Kit Kat. And um, I stuck them in. And then the opening line of my CV was, you know, dear whoever, um, or the, the letter, sorry. You're obviously very busy in your role as you know, head of sports science or, or some of them are managers, you know, the, the, the first team. Um, please take out five minutes to have a break, which was the old Kit Kat slogan, and, and read my CV. And, it, you know, it wasn't very successful in terms of um, getting paid employment at the time. I obviously got the opportunity at Barnsley, which materialised into that. But I, I, I did get probably 70% of the, the people I wrote to sent a letter back just to say, nice idea, thank you, but we've got nothing you know at our club but you know it, I've still got the letters my mum and dad have got them at home they're really nice you know some of them signed by the official manager or whoever themselves but some of them are just pp'd by the receptionist but it was a bit different a bit novel and I think it you know it worked for me in one way getting me in the mm. door that's really interesting have you read um Seth Godin's Purple Cow by any chance 
Not read that, no. No, it's, I mean, it's basically, it's a marketing book, but his idea is, you know, people drive past cows every day. If you were to paint a cow yeah. purple, people would stop, get out, take a picture with it, you know, because it's unique and it's different. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. hence the, the Kit Kat idea is a bit of a purple cow, I guess. It's not something I've heard of before. Yeah. I don't think many people have done it. No, well, I, I, I mean, I don't know if I'd do it again. I don't know. It's, it's a little bit cheesy, but it worked. You know, it got me, it got me what I wanted, which was a foot in the door. And I've gone on since there. So, you know, something that I, I tell students it now, I say, you've got to be a bit different. Try this one or try something similar. So, mm -hmm. so obviously that initial love of the game and love of sport is what, what got you into sport. But now if you were to kind of dig under the surface a bit, what, what is the underlying driver for what you do? Why is it that you want to keep this journey going? Yeah, I think this is the, when you sent over the questions, this is the one that got me, it stopped me and thought, well, what, why do I do, why do I do what I do? And why do I, you know, get up out of bed? Obviously the, the, the business stuff on top of my education is extra. It's just something I don't need to do really. But I, but, and the ultimate, the answer to the question is because I love it so much. It's, it's not, um, it isn't to me like work. And a lot of people might say the same, it's a hobby. Um, and it infuriates my wife immensely that, I actually enjoy working a lot. Um, you know, I, I'll, I, I, I don't see standing in front of an athlete or a group of athletes as, as work. I see it as the next best thing to me being an athlete. And, and really, it's just a hobby. You know, I don't really have many other hobbies outside of here. I'm terrible at golf. I like bike riding, like cycling and things. But, but other than that, I don't really have any other form of, of hobby because what I do is so enjoyable. And I, and I like to fill my time doing it. So I guess that is, that is the thing. That, that drives me it's as funny as you're saying that i'm smiling away because i can relate to that a lot i'm exactly the same my girlfriend told me a few months ago that i was boring because i didn't do anything other thing anything other than talk about snc and work and i guess in my spare time here i am on a podcast talking about that same stuff but yeah that yeah, love for it is definitely drives you doesn't it yeah my, my wife's a nurse so she watches you know a lot of the medical programs on telly and all that and it, some of them are interesting and I show interest here and there, but I'm not interested generally. But so I'll usually have the iPad or my laptop open watching some CPD or just, just, you know, reading something and trying to keep me active, but not, you know, it's not studious all the time. It's just cause I enjoy it. I'm interested in other people's perspectives on things and, um, and that's it really. That's my hobby. So. Mm, fantastic. So looking back, you know, along your journey, you know, you've mentioned obviously coaching from a pretty young age across different mm -hmm. contexts with multi-sport or, or football or, you know, going to teaching. What experiences yeah. and people stand out as being ones that were really influential in, in your shaping your coaching practice and your teaching practice? Um, I've got I've got a lot of a very diverse teaching and, and coaching background. I originally started when I was at college. Um, doing sort of the school clubs, you know, multi-sports after school clubs with a, with a local company and um, you turn up and you've just got a group of children that sometimes don't want to be there. They're just put there because it gives their mum and dad another hour or two at work. So you end up having to try and engage and motivate them people. And then it, it got into more kind of football coaching originally. I, I'm a B-licensed coach in football. So that was my initial coaching education was level one, two and three in football. And that was very much where I wanted to be. Um, it was only during my time at university where I started to kind of explore sports science a little bit and then later S&C. Um, but it was, it was those kind of practices that, that got me into it. And whilst I was at, on my undergrad, I, I coached the Everton um, Disability Organisation. So the, the football club had the disability arm and went down there. And on the same pitch, it was pan disability. So various different disabilities that categorised on their severity. And on the same pitch, I had players with hearing impairments, visual impairments, people that had, you know, some form of cerebral palsy or other learning difficulties. And you're thinking, how do I communicate with these? You know, how, how can I, because I can't demonstrate things because the people with visual impairments find it difficult to, to see that. And if I just use verbal cues, then other people find it difficult. So that I spent nearly three, my whole undergrad period with Everton and, and got really immersed in that environment. And it, it taught me so many skills from a, from a communication perspective about how to get messages across. But the other thing it taught me was how, how valuable coaching could be. You know, the, the, it, it really did. It, it, was, it really did change their lives, being exposed to sport in a way that they probably didn't think they could be because of their disability. And seeing how much impact it had on those young people influenced me as a coach and said, oh, yeah, this is where I want to be. You know, I want to be working with people and influencing them that way. Um, so I guess that's the, the, the main thing. 
I never really had a mentor. I've, I've still never really had a, a specific mentor. I've had loads of people that have influenced me in a good way, like from different, you know, coaches, but particularly in education where I spend most of my time, I've had some excellent people that have shown me the ropes from a classroom or, you know, education perspective. But I guess the, the, the various people that you pull into from those have contributed to my philosophy and, and how I do things now. Probably the, the, the standout environment, I would say, is, was Middlesbrough when I worked at um, the academy at Middlesbrough. Um, Dave Parnaby was the academy manager there and had been for a long time and, and actually retired during my last year at the club. Um, and they had the three principles of honesty, humility and respect. And that was the, the one environment where it literally did run top to bottom. Everyone had those same principles and they, they, they run by them. And, and that influenced my coaching. You know, I think if you're, if you're honest, if you don't know the answer to something and an athlete asks you and you tell them, you, you've got far more respect from them than if you try and make it up and, and they find out that you're wrong. Um, you know, respecting athletes and then respecting you. But then, you know, if you do something well or, you, or, or you know, things are going well, then you need to have humility with it, you know, rather than ignorance and or arrogance that goes with that. I think those principles have guided me throughout my, my time since then. But also I like to think that I, I had a lot of those principles already in my profession. So it's really interesting that Everton experience sounds actually like a real uh, fast track of coaching skills, doesn't it? When you think about the things that you need to have as a coach, you know, be able to do silent demonstrations, being able to explain something, having those people with those, I guess, restrictions really, yeah. I guess, would emphasize the ability to be competent or proficient in all of those different areas as a coach. It, it was huge. It, and, and to be honest, Rob, it was completely by chance. It wasn't, um, it wasn't that I deliberately went there. Right? I, I arrived in Liverpool. Uh, I live in York. So I arrived in Liverpool thinking, right, I've been coaching at college for the last year or two. I want to I carry that on. And um, I just found a number in, in like the local phone book. And it was, it was Everton FC. And I thought, OK, I'll try and see if I can get involved in there. Because I was doing my level two at the time. So I'm thinking I can... You know, try and offer something with the academy age groups. But what I didn't realise is, is it the number in the book was the foundation, what's now the foundation, but then it was just the disability pathway. And and he ended up speaking to to the staff there, and they said, "Come on down." And then it was it was all voluntary. There was never any money for it. But the, the, as you mentioned, the life experience it taught me as a coach and the skills I had to develop were were irreplaceable. And it's actually. I'm, I'm, I've come full circle. I'm now working with GB Goalball. So through my work at the university, we, we offer some support to them. And I hadn't worked with uh, disability athletes for nearly 10 years, but the skills I learned then came straight back to me now because they're, they're visually impaired athletes that I work with now. So I, I can able to communicate with them and I'd learned a lot of those skills previously that I could call upon now. So really beneficial. Mm -hmm. Hmm, fantastic. I mean, what's there that to me there just twice you've obviously mentioned you're a pretty proactive guy. Like you're not sitting there waiting for people to come and, you know, knock down your door. You're sending out letters, you're ringing up phone numbers. You obviously are someone who, you know, was determined to be involved in sport. Yeah, I don't like standing still. I, you know, whatever I do, I, 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 I look to, to move on to the next level and it doesn't necessarily you know, need to be a, a, a job title or anything like that. I just like, I like to fill my days and I, I don't like time to pass me by. So if I'm not doing something, then I, I like to, to seek out new challenges and, and test myself in different environments. And yes, I'm busy. My mates, my mates, you know, always saying how busy I am and, and I've got this going on, but I, I feel like I've always got time for my friends and my family and things like that. And, you know, it's just working efficiently, but, I, but, that I don't want to be sat on the sofa five nights a week watching crappy telly when I know I can influence other people, you know? Fantastic. So, so yeah. I don't know if you've given much thought to it, but what would you say is your kind of current philosophy, your current approach to your coaching practice? What are the common themes, I guess, regardless of the athletes that you're working with, able or, or disabled, or, um, you know, what are the things that, that define you as a coach in your philosophy? Um, I think... I think there's far better coaches than me in terms of their technical knowledge. Um, I, you know, I'm accredited with the UKSCA and, and I've got a master's in SNC and things. And I know, I know enough to be an SNC coach and I, I'm not just selling myself in that form. I know the, the technical content, but, but what I am particularly good at, and I think is my philosophy is building relationships um, and building a rapport with whoever I work with. So, for me, I'm very lucky in, in that I'm a teacher nine to five and then I'm a coach, but 
it's the same job. You know, work, teaching and coaching is exactly the same. Except the, the, the environment that you might be in or the, or the topic you're teaching is, is very different. But, but basically, it's building relationships to educate people is, is, this, is the skill. And, and just because I've done it for a long time now, um, and practiced it and actively sought out new new challenges. I, I feel like the, the art part of it, the coaching, building relationships is my particular strength. Um, like I said before, some of the stuff that people put out about the, you know, the different isometric protocols for different situations or, you know, injury rehab, all those things, brilliant. I'm not your go-to man for that. You know, there's, the, there's people with, that are far smarter in terms of their technical knowledge for certain things beyond the X's and O's, the basics. But the ability to build a relationship with a young person or an, an older person and, and, and hit them at a level that I think they need, I think is my real strength. Um, for example, like my, the, 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 I do privately at the minute, I have maybe six or seven sessions on a Friday evening and um, I have a 10 year old that comes in who's never been in a gym before. He's never done any kind of physical development work. So it's very much about, in, in, you know, developing the fundamental movements, you know, can they do the, the exercises later on three or four years time that, that 14, 15 year olds should be able to do. And at the minute that's quite very, it's very, very basic, but we have a good laugh. We make it fun. But then the very next session, I've got a, a GB, uh, sorry, an England women's rugby league player come in who's targeting the world cup next year. And you're like, my technique and approach with her is so, so, so different, but I feel like they both walk out with a smile feeling like they've got the same, you know, benefit from the session. And I think that's my real strength. And um, obviously they do different things in the session as well. So the, the actual prescription of exercise is different, but the ability to, to formulate a rapport at different levels is definitely my, my key philosophy and it is in teaching and it is in coaching. So uh, I think one, one of your previous guests, um, was it Steve Edwards a few weeks ago said, said something similar, you know, if, if people are, enjoying what they're doing or they're engaged with you as a coach they've got half a chance of learning and that's my 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 philosophy in in, a, in the education you know too many practitioners or too many academics sorry are very much academics and they don't build the relationship they stand and chalk and talk and, and just deliver the content but if a student or or an, or an athlete in the coaching sense don't have a relationship with you or don't trust you enough they just switch off so for me, it's, it's important before I even start teaching them anything is to just develop in that relationship, that trust. Am I a nice person? Do, we, do I see us having a relationship? Yes. Okay. Right. We've got that. Then I can start to educate them in the way that I see best for that person. So, so tell us about athlete discovery. So obviously it's a, you know, I guess an add on to what you're doing as well, but how did that come about and, and what does that look like day to day around your, your teaching load? Yeah, so it, it, it came about when, um, when my daughter was born. So um, I worked at Middlesbrough and I was there for three years and that was evenings and weekends or mainly evenings, the odd weekend really. But traveling from York, it's, it's sort of an hour commute up there. So I ended up, you know, leaving for work in the morning at eight and not getting home till nine o'clock, three or four nights in a week. So I thought that's not sustainable with a, with a young family. So I, I left that at the end of that season and... Um, had a year out just to adapt to the, to the bombshell that is being a dad. And then, and then I missed it. I missed coaching. So I, I thought, well, I need something that, that fills that void, but doesn't require me to, to commit so many hours in, in such a um, confined way, you know, in terms of it was these days at these times I had to go. So I, that's where the business came about, where I, I could um, coach. And my friend of mine runs a, a, a sports therapy clinic nearby he said I could use the, the rehab or the gym based area that, that's associated with that. It's like 10 minutes from my house. So I can cycle there. I can, I can drive obviously if I've got the car and I just book people in as, and when, when, when I'm free. So, I, you know, I try and stick to the same nights each week, but sometimes due to whatever it has to change. But, um, I generally work my own time around my wife's shifts and everything else and family life. And I still get the same buzz from it, you know, I, but the good, the good thing is I see such a range of, of athletes come in. Um, and the, the overall aim of the business was to fill a gap because you'll know working at the level you do that the, the, the best practitioners are quite often tied up in what we would class as elite. So academy settings, you know, the age group rugby settings, you know, the, the higher level athletes get a good service in terms of physical development. They also might get some nutrition. They might get some psychology support. 
but grassroots athletes don't have anything. You know, they might have a dad who's a coach or someone who's got a, a coaching qualification that turns up and, and does that. But, but they, they, they're maybe limited to making that next step based on not having that physical support. You know, if, you know, in your sport in rugby, if, if you're not physically robust enough or strong enough to handle the demands of rugby, you're going to make, it's going to be really difficult for you to make that step into the academy environment or that, that regional, you know, selection group. So I felt, I felt that I could fill a gap and, and offer that kind of service to people that don't normally have it. Um, okay, it's a paid service, but if they want it and they really feel like they need to make that step up, then they can do. So, um, Yeah, I think, I think that's really, really interesting. And it is something that's really important. I mean, it's a move I'm considering myself, but, you know, we both will have come across athletes that maybe could have made that, that you know, bridge that gap, but didn't have the support when, when it was needed. And, you know, you don't need to be digging into talent development research and, and books for very long to, you know, figure out that tunnel of once you get in the system, you get better coaching, you get better resources, you get better support. So that chasm widens and it becomes harder and harder to cross. But actually, if you do have a 14 year old that, you know, someone in some high tower somewhere decided that he wasn't a good enough footballer at 14, actually being able to support him for a couple more years might help him get back into that system or get back up to that next level. Yeah. And one of the, one of my favorite quotes is the Kelvin Giles one about, you know, you have to have the physical qualities to be able to handle the technical qualities and then the tactical stuff goes and it's in that order and, I, and I'm a big believer of that and it it frustrates me where you know some people I've worked with are excellent technical coaches and everything they've got in place is is technical this technical that the players are technically brilliant but they break down anytime you put three or four sessions back to back you know and it's like that that physical prepare, preparedness if you like is often missed out because it detract. It often does take time away from from the technical development, but it's, in my eyes, it's so important because if you can keep the players on the pitch long term, then you'll have more technical time with them anyway. So, mm. you know, it's that it's that kind of you know backwards thinking that you have to try and educate other people around. But that's that's where I'm coming from with it. I, I'm trying to fill a gap, and um, most of the people that come see me are, are in decent level, maybe not elites. I've got a couple of professional athletes, but mostly. Uh, amateur or, or semi-professional but they wherever they are they don't have access to that specialist staff um, which is exactly what I'm what I'm there for is to offer that to people that want it yeah I think that's something that we'll probably see even more in the next 12 months I guess with you know budgets being trimmed for organizations to kind of try and survive the the COVID situation is that you know academies that maybe weren't very self-sufficient might have their s c budgets trimmed or you know, programs that weren't maybe quite pulling in the income that they needed to be will be trimmed. And I think there's going to be a bigger demand for that because athletes will be used to have, you know, having their SNC session on a Monday and a Friday or whatever. And now they're not. And it's thinking, yeah. well, actually, you know, someone's gone to the, ha- to the trouble of convincing that person it's beneficial and now it's been taken away. So I do yeah. think they're going to see more demand for that. And you, and you see it, I mean, at the very highest level, you see um, professional athletes having their own sort of support team, you know, underneath what they get from their club. They, they have their own support team where they might go and do top-up sessions. They might have additional recovery. So it's becoming more, more common. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not sure I agree with that. I think what you get at the club should be what you have. And, you know, from my, from my PhD will talk about is a training low perspective is as soon as people start going to do other stuff, if they've got it there, it's like, well, how do you control, you know, the, the training loads? But, but in this case, the, the, I, I specialize generally in, in teenagers, 12 to 18 year olds. Um, they don't have that. So it's not on top of anything. It's just replacing something that they probably should have already in their program. Mm -hmm. So tell us a bit more about your, your lecturing role and your role at the university. Yeah. So, so I'm full-time at York St. John university and have been for, I think I've been there four years now. And before that I was at um, FE colleges in similar sort of area, but so I'm I'm full-time specializing in areas such as injury prevention uh, and rehab. They're my kind of main topics, but, I've taught on various different sports science and you know modules in the past, so that's my my kind of remit during the day. I'm I lead the year three eight uh, year group, so anything to do with the final year of students, so trying to ease that transition between being a student and going into the workplace. So particularly do a lot of work with placements, partnerships with local clubs and and organisations to try and get students that that opportunity that I had when I was at university to to coach really. Um, so that's the day job and that's where, you know, I'm doing my PhD. Well, I'm actually doing my PhD for the University of Gloucestershire, but 
Um, obviously, I'm teaching at, at York St. John. Um, so that's my day job, teaching and PhD. And then the business, the, the athlete discovery stuff is a couple of nights a week around that. So, you know, usually a Wednesday and a Friday night, I do some sessions. So. so tell us a bit more about your PhD research, because it's an area I think is, is going to be of real interest to the audience and, and people who are dealing with, with youth athletes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm probably uh, <laughs> two thirds of the way through my PhD, I'm like not quite three quarters, I don't think. So it's um, looking at the associations between uh, injury, training load and biological maturity. So it, it won't be of any surprise to anyone who's worked with, with like pubescent uh, athletes that 13, 14, 15 in boys, a couple of years earlier for girls, you end up getting high incidence of injuries, um, mostly growth related, non-contact type injuries, you know, the, the old Osgoods, the Severs, those kind of things that we're all familiar with. And it, it came about when I was at, at Middlesbrough working with those age groups, with the physio staff, I, I kind of sat there and thought, I've been here three years and every year I see the same things, you know, the same people come in with the same issues or the same time of year, we see the same kind of things. And this isn't just a three year thing. This has been going on for as long as anyone's been involved in the sport. So surely if we, if these things are a pattern and they're going to happen all the time, we must be able to be a bit more proactive about, about dealing with them. So the majority of these injuries, if you look at the, the epidemiology studies are, are non-contact and growth related. There's a huge array of research linking those kinds of non-contact injuries or soft tissue injuries in, in the adult game and training load. So, I, so my idea was, well, let's try and see if we can marry these two up in academy settings. Now, there's a couple of complexities with that is that obviously in academies, they don't have the same resources that the adult teams have. So all the research that's published in the top journals, usually done with professional teams that have, you know, three or four support staff deep who get the GPS data, get the training load data from whatever metrics they're using. And then, you know, you know and then do something with that in terms of analyzing it. Um, most academies don't have access to GPS at that level. They rely on uh, subjective you know, RPEs and things like that. And even that's patchy in terms of you actually need someone at every session to be able to collate that. Then once you've got it, you need someone to be able to put it into a system that's, that's usable in terms of can actually then inform training going forward, which is rare. So there's so many issues around training load monitoring in academy settings, which, which is why it's very much an under-researched area, despite most of us knowing that there must be something going on. There must be, there must be a relationship between maturation and their response to training load. Cause you know, you'll have seen it yourself, Rob, someone down here and then someone up here in the same age group cannot be responding in the same way to that training load that you've put on. You know, you, you do an hour's training session, gym field based, they cannot be responding in the same way because you know, they've got different muscle mass, some of the research around the differences in terms of height, weight, you know, body mass index, calorie intake or calorie usage per day, it's, it's quite frightening really, the variation within age groups. So my whole theory was that there must be something in it. Um, and it's, it's quite difficult to prove. <laughs> mm, mm. Uh, so what, what have you, talk us through your first couple of studies and I guess the kind of setup and what kind of some of the trends that you've seen. So the first study, uh, which has been published in uh, International Journal of Sports Physiology and Performance, so that's it's on ResearchGate now, but it's not come out as a as the, it's not printed in the journal yet. Um, that was a, a survey of, of is it my, my PhD is predominantly in football. It is in football, but I think the, the principles and the and the, the findings will be you know related to other sports. So I did a survey of the um, academy clubs uh, in terms of what they do for monitoring. So ask simple questions about do they monitor maturation, you know, and how do they do it? What method do they use? How often do they do it? Who's responsible for doing that? And then I did exactly the same with training load. So, you know, what training load metrics do they record? Um, how do they do it? Who's responsible for that? Who gets the reports? That kind of thing. Um, and it was quite in informative in terms of pretty much every academy that I asked does training load monitoring and maturity monitoring. They vary in terms of how they do that. So obviously you would expect your category one academies to do a little bit more robust job in terms of they might have access to more resources from staff, equipment, um, but, but pretty much everyone does it. And the primary reason that they do it is injury prevention um, and you know training prescription and things like that. 
So, so I think we're, we're halfway there in terms of everyone's doing it and they're doing it for the right reasons. The problem is the reporting of that and the feedback to that wasn't great um, in terms of who received the feedback. You know, medical staff weren't always involved in the loop, but they're often the ones who have to deal with the problem so they can maybe inform the decision-making process beforehand. Um, sometimes what really surprised me was when it comes to maturation monitoring, the club takes the data and has that data, but doesn't tell the parent or the player. So I was like, well, if you think about how stressful academy environments can be for, for families, um, you know, particularly around re retain and release of, of players, you know, you've got a player who's potentially going through quite a lot of school in terms of exams, you know, stress, all that kind of thing about transitions. Am I going to be a professional? Am I going to go and go to college or do something else? But the, the club has information on them, which might alleviate some of that stress by saying, you know what, we understand that you're a late developer, you're going through your growth period, we're going to give you time to help you come through and show us what you've got from a physical perspective, rather than just the technical. But the, the fact is that very few, if in fact, nearly none, informed the parents of that it was really surprising, because I think that not telling people and, and allowing that stress to build up and not, not pitching where it was, can actually make that, that problem worse. Um, so I think communication is key, you know, with the club and the parents telling them where they are, just saying, you know, you've had your growth period, so we can afford to push you a little bit now because your body's so receptive to the type of training that we're going to be doing. Or if, you know, one individual's not doing as much training, he's been pulled out a bit early or he's doing additional stuff in the gym rather than going out to do some high intensity stuff on the pitch, that, that could be communicated as to why better. Because um, mm. they're, they're all equally good uh, methods to reduce training load or reduce training stress should I say on on those individuals but the communication of why that's happening isn't always there and I think it's it's something that could be improved yeah that certainly would help with in terms of managing expectations wouldn't it in terms of expectations from the player and the parents of you know why is my little Johnny not been you know why is he not playing up a level well he's not playing up a level because he's actually a late mature and we're giving him a chance but like you say if it's not being communicated and that's perceived as oh He's not doing very well. He's he's behind everyone else who's being played up. And it's, well, actually, yeah. we're talking apples and oranges. You know, yeah. we're doing what's right for him. On the um, on the UKSCA roundtable thing, I suggested something similar. Um, and Pordy mentioned that, you know, the last thing we want to do is take individuals out of training. Whatever, whatever part of that maturation cycle they're in, what we don't want to be doing is saying, don't train, you know. What we need to do is modify their training in some way. And it's about being smart how we do that. So... For example, I use the, the example of if you're, if you're playing a game where there might be bounce players on the outside, is that the, the individual that's maybe going through that growth period, that rapid growth period, which, and I'll discuss my second study in a minute, may be a period of, of uh, accelerated stress. Maybe they spend a bit longer on the outside. So maybe they, they, they don't do as much of the acceleration, deceleration, and that mechanical load that's, that's quite detrimental on the joints. And, and puts a lot of stress on those connective tissues. Maybe they spend a bit longer on the outside, but if they wonder why they're on the outside a bit longer because they haven't been told, they're going to think that they're out of favour. Maybe they're not, you know, not part of the team as much, and and then all sorts of, you know, psychological issues start from there in terms of stress and you know perceived incompetence and all that kind of thing, which we want to try and avoid. So communication paramount in my in my view from that perspective. Hmm. Brilliant. So talk us through that second study. What, what did you look at and what did you find? So the, set, so the second study um, was, uh, which is under review at the minute, so I'm hopeful that that might be out fairly soon, um, was looking at a fixed training load. So obviously within training sessions and matches, everyone does their own different thing. So you have different positions on the pitch, which naturally variances how much the running they do or the sprints or the change of direction. You'll have um, people of different maturity. So obviously, if they are a little bit older, they might be able to run a little bit further just naturally because of that, you know, it's less stress for them or you would imagine that is the case. So I fixed a, a stimulus using the, the youth saft, a 60 minute protocol, and then I assessed them before, middle and after in terms of um, some neuromuscular markers of stiffness, jump, reactive strength index, and some RPEs afterwards as well, using differential RPE. And we just looked at the observation that, you know, from that, that fixed stimulus, everybody did exactly the same in terms of their distance, their time on the pitch, the amount of accelerations, decelerations was all exactly the same. And what was their perceived, but also their objective from the neuromuscular differences in how they responded. And it's difficult with, you know, that was quite a time 
time heavy uh, resource. You know, you got each individual player an hour at a time. You need the GPS. You need you're taking players out of their training protocol. So the sample size isn't huge. Fifty five it was, I think, it ended up being. So that's that's a decent number. But when you when you split that into the different categories or the different maturity bands, you end up with a reasonably small group. But tentatively, I think there's some relationship with um, what happens around the, the growth the growth spurt and and player load so from the gps so player load's a good marker of you know the, the mechanical load that's going on the body it can be as, as a surrogate for stiffness and things like that there was definitely some relationship there now it's not it's not hugely conclusive based on the the sample size but there is definitely and hopefully hopefully this does get published because people will be able to see on the figures on that there is definitely a relationship pretty much bang on that that 86 percent to 93 percent uh, predicted adult height and um, there is definitely something going on there and that's also the case that that starts around the, the peak height velocity period with absolute and relative stiffness so again there is some relationship although it's not um conclusive it's, it's there's definitely some relationship there that the mechanics and their response to load starts to change around that growth period now the, the theory around that you know, is, is out there for debate, but John Radner's done some really good work about the development of the stretch shortening cycle through maturation. And I, and I think there's a lot of that to do around the, the tendon capabilities and the, what, what is it that yields? Is it the tendon or is it the muscle that yields first? And that changes as we go through our, our growth period. And I'd recommend anyone to read that, that excellent work. And I think that's, that's something to do with it. In terms of their perception, the players didn't really think it was any different. So less mature players didn't rate it as harder, which would have been hypothesized considering it was the same load. Although they did think that technically, so the, one of the differential RPE methods is a, is a, it's called technical RPE, which is a marker of their cognitive load and their, their, you know, the, the technicalities of, of what they're doing and how much stress they perceive that from a, a cognitive perspective. And there was some relationship there. So the young or less mature players found that more, uh, cognitively demanding than the more mature players. Mm. So they're very early findings with a small sample size, but I think it's the first study that really shows that there, there are both objective and subjective differences between, you know, a, a, a standardized session for these players. Um, the, the third study, which I'm, I'm currently analyzing at the minute, so hopefully that'll be out soon, is, is a season long version of that. Um, so looking at the training loads for a, a whole season, and just seeing if that that acute study is mirrored in a long term, um, a long term process. Mm, brilliant. And there's some really good stuff there because I think it's it's one of the things where you know, as you say, training load can could be used so well to inform or even I guess potentially to prescribe for those athletes at different stages and and what you know thresholds might be too much or too little, etc. But it's not something that's used a lot. Um, and again, we just kind of paint everyone with the same brush, right? We're all doing the same session. We're all doing this. So it's actually, you know, as you said, if things are being perceived differently, both objectively and subjectively, then actually effectively we're giving out different sessions. Yeah. 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 And it, I mean, there's, there's so many difficulties with it. And, and, you know, from a, from a scientific point of view, we don't know what they've done during the day. You know, if you're working with a professional team, and they turn up in the morning and you prescribe their whole training loads and they go home and they rest and then they come back the next day. You know exactly what they've done from a physical point of view, but the likelihood is that these guys come and they train for two hours a day or whatever it is, but then they've been at the park with their mates or they've done cross country at school or they've been, you know, at a sports camp all day or something. So it is only a portion of the pie and I'm fully aware of that, but we have to start somewhere. You know, we have to, we have to find out if, if there is a physical or, or, you know, even a biomechanical difference between those stages. And then we can work backwards and go, right, okay, how does it, how does it change if we do this? If we increase loads at this point or reduce loads or vice versa at different stages. And that's ultimately, that's what I want my PhD to do is provide some guidelines to coaches to say, these guys struggle with this amount of load or these guys find this particular part of training load more difficult than this. And, and hopefully, you know, it won't solve the question and it won't answer it, but it might help to alleviate some of that, that growth related injury stress that we see that is, that is in my view, you know, this is anecdotal, but is, is mechanically driven in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, the loading on those connective tissues. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, this is something I want to dive into. Actually just let yesterday, I had a phone call with a, with a parent who was looking 
um, just privately to get some strength conditioning for the for their child who was you know having issues with severs um, and basically you know talking through their situation the, you know we've had a worldwide pandemic not been doing a whole lot and then suddenly he's back to football rugby golf tennis doing everything and I guess we don't have a huge number of precedents for this sort of situation um, but one of the ones we do have is the NFL lockout where obviously you know it was kind of widely put out on strength conditioning social media that you know, actually, we've got an, uh, some sort of an example of this thing happening previously where at a professional level, players didn't do everything for three months. And when they came back, injuries skyrocketed compared to a previous season. Now, you don't need to be a genius that if professional players aren't able to maintain that, then amateur players, high school players, you know, college players are going to have pretty similar, if not worse, situations, but particularly around the growth situation. Yeah, exactly. And, and one of the things that I didn't mention before when he when he spoke about the athlete discovery stuff. One of the things that is becoming a, a, a real passion of mine is coach education. So I'm really considering doing some, maybe some online stuff, but definitely some face to face um, seminars or, or, or workshops for coaches about this kind of thing, about how they can can manage that. Because after lockdown, as you, as you mentioned there, I've seen coaches just go straight back into how it was before, you know, and and, and even. I've seen players, I've, I've spoken to players who I work with who played matches before they've trained because they're so desperate to, to get back on the pitch, the, the clubs, and they've arranged friendlies ahead of the season to get back in the swing of it, that they've not actually had a training session. They've just gone out match on Wednesday, get yourselves down. And you think, what? On, like, how, obviously, you know, we're used to the, all the research is on elite athletes and how they step progression and all that. And I'm with my role at the university, used to reading that, but it applies to, to everybody. And, and, I really think we're missing a trick if we don't apply this to, to the grassroots, which is, again, that service that I try and provide is educating them the, the, the way that the elite athletes get but at a grassroots level. And I think, you know, integrating people slowly into increasing those training loads in whatever format, you know, or sport they have has to be a priority to, to prevent these load related injuries. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I remember um, a good friend of mine, uh, Tom Smale, who I used to work with, would say that the there's no point trying to teach an athlete about recovery when they're fresh. You have to wait till they're tired. And I think maybe the same thing kind of applies here in that, you know what, no one really cares about a training load when everything's going great. And maybe this is an opportunity where, you know, it's unfortunate that people maybe get themselves in that situation, but we have to say, do you know what? I can tell you why this has happened. It's yeah, because yeah. we've gone from zero to a hundred miles an hour and we've not graded it progressively. And that's the way we should be training all the time. Yeah. Um, one of the things I did during lockdown, obviously had a bit more time away from everything to, to set some stuff up, is I set up a, a, a training load monitoring Google Docs document for the athletes that I work with. And, and then I just tell them, you know, I, I'm not going to manipulate the training load because they're, they're with their clubs and they, and they do that. But it's exactly as you mentioned there, it's a way of us explaining why things have happened. If, so they, they record their, their training load from that, just from RPEs um, after every session duration and, and the RPEs. And then I, I just keep a log of that over time. And if they come in to me and I say, I always ask them how they're feeling, what they've been up to that day. And if they say, oh, I feel tired and lethargic, I have a look at it and I go, well, look at what you've done the last three or four days. You know, that's probably why. And they don't even, they don't even realize how much work they're putting in. Because again, like we said at the start of this, they enjoy it. That's their hobby. They love doing it. And then, and then it's only when they look back at it and go, wow, you know, yeah, that's, that's why I'm like I am. So hmm. So let's dig into the, the growth related thing a, a little bit more. So obviously you kind of said, you know, you don't have the kind of hardcore evidence as yet, but anecdotally, and we know from, I know personally from speaking to other people at football clubs who, who work with younger athletes than I do that, you know, by putting things in place, they've actually managed to get a handle on things like Severs and Osgood Sliders. So what's your, your inclination? What, what do you think is the, is the relationship there? So, I, so I, I think, and this is purely anecdotal from my own experience in sport, but also my very tentative uh, studies in this area, that it's the, because it's, you'll, you'll see that all coaches want their players to be on fire. They want them to be 100% all the time. And that usually, and, and the way that the modern game is going, particularly for my PhD in, in the football, is everything's faster, everything's more intense, it's you know, moving the ball quickly. That's usually done over a small area. And, and that increases, in my view, the, the accelerations, the decelerations, the change of direction that are associated with that. And that then increases the, the stress on those connective tissues. So 
one one driver of this is sometimes, and this this came out in a discussion I had with a coach about this, is sometimes they can't train over large areas because they've only got a third of a pitch. You know, in terms of like an academy, three age groups share a pitch. They might have a third. So everything they do tends to be over small areas. But that naturally causes a spike in that, that accelerative and decelerative load where actually they're not getting that more extensive work in. They're not getting that longer distance stuff when... So th- th- this is a hunch, but I, I do think that it's driven by that, that high-end, rapid change of speed and momentum um, at activities, um, yeah. which is why I think the player load on the GPS, which could have been down to other things as well, but, but I, d- I do think that, that that relationship was was evident, that something was going on around peak height velocity. And I, and I just think, as you'll know, you know, the bones grow, then the muscles follow. And there's a lag period between that where our connective tissues are susceptible to, inc- I know we need load to stimulate that growth, but we don't need that much load. And I think it's that period where maybe our bones are quite heavy and we're accelerating them quite fast and we're maybe not able to decelerate them as much, which is causing these overuse type injuries. Hmm. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Like, as you say, if you understand the growth and maturation process and the order in which things happen. Um, and then also, you know, as you say, it's high force, rapid changes of directions, accelerations, decelerations. And, you know, the situation you described where people are limited to a you know, half a pitch or a third of a pitch. Mm-hmm. You're, yeah, you're absolutely right. And the rise of the popularity of small sided games and things like that in these scenarios are going to give a bit, a bit more of a rise to that and, and potentially overload players who are still developing physically. Yeah, There's similar trends have been found in tennis and racket sports as well. And obviously that characterized by the similar type of actions, you know, very short, sharp, intense so that this, these are the kind of things that are leading me down that track um, there have been similar injury trends in other sports as well but to have a lesser you know incidence i guess or the burden is much lower in other sports compared to more short distance sports which is where it's leading me down that path but you know i, I have no evidence of that at the minute um, but anecdotally I'm, and the very tentative findings that I found suggest that might be the case. Mm. So you think then it's potentially more limited to those high intensity actions than perhaps total distance or total duration? Yeah, I think, I think the, I mean, duration's a, duration's a a strange one because we do say like the longer you spend out on the pitch, the higher the load, but that's not necessarily the case. You could be doing something really low level on the pitch for ages. Walking football. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Anything like even, you know, most teams will do shape work or shadow play the day before a match in whatever sport very low intensity, often quite boring, but they might be on the pitch for an hour, but they've not really done anything. So so duration is one thing. It's that it's the intensity and that, um, you know, the repeated acceleration, deceleration that drives it. But that's characterized quite often in sport because coaches only see you two or three times a week. So they want to get the most out of it in that time. But, but sometimes they might be doing that in the playground or on the park all day, or they might've been for a cross country. And then we go, Oh, by the way, you're going to work really hard for two hours. So, it is difficult and I, I don't blame the coaches, you know, cause they, they have to, you know, they're there to do a job, but I just think that it's, it's kind of a, a perfect storm really. Mm. Especially as you say, when you throw in double PE and cross country and, you know, all these kind of things that I kind of fly under the radar a lot of the time and the coach isn't aware of, you know, the yeah. number of times I've had, I've players turn up and say, you know, actually we did this, this and this today. And I said, right, well, the only thing I want you to get out of this session today is that you leave feeling better than when you walked in. <laughs> Exactly. That's all I care about today. We're not going to squat. We're not going to do anything. We're, we're just going to, you're going to foam roll. You're going to stretch. You're going to have a little, you know, bit of recovery session on the bike. I just want you to feel better than when you walked in. Yeah. And, you, and you're lucky if they tell you they've done that, you know, um, you know, a lot of them don't want to tell you that they've done something at school or, or whatever else, because they'll think you won't let them train. Um, or they, you know, they're really looking forward to going out and playing with their mates on the pitch, but you'll think they'll think oh you have to stay in the gym and do some yoga well that might be the case but it's in your best interest so they, they often don't tell you what they've done at school thinking that that's the best thing but then they break down and then you end up like banging your head against the wall mm-hmm. now it's a really interesting area and i think you know one that we're as you say we're kind of just at the tip of the iceberg of really mm-hmm. understanding this and coming away with ways and methods of being able to do the best thing by these athletes um in terms of you know, handing out the right dosages of training and making sure people are not not being exposed to too much risk or too little, et cetera. So it's an area that's got real potential to, to make an impact in youth sport, isn't it? And the good thing is, you know, the last 12 to 18 months, there's a real boom in research in this area. Um, you know, 
I know you've had Sean coming on and doing some excellent work down at Bath with his PhD students. So you've got Dave Johnson at Bournemouth and Megan Hill and, um, you know, Joe Eisenman across the pond doing some great things around this. And there's so many people doing excellent work in this growth and maturation field. Every, almost every month, there's new like breaking findings in this area. And I really think it's, it's, a, it's an area to watch out for and one much needed. And I think together we can really influence this field. So, mm. So I um, mean, you've already rattled off a few there, but I just thought, you know, for coaches who maybe this is their first time kind of hearing about this kind of stuff and hearing about the potential relationship between training and, and growth um, related injuries, where would you signpost people to kind of get, I guess, a, a beginner's guide to these kind of things? Yeah, I think um, yeah, I mentioned Sean coming there. Sean's got uh, his own, his own research in this area and has done for many years with, uh, you know, Bob Molina and people like that, the, the kind of, you know, experts in our field but he also Sean also has several PhD students who are doing work from here so I think if you if you went to Sean on ResearchGate you'd find a list of you know a, a, a plethora of research underneath that um, where people are doing Joe Eisenman uh, is a associate lecturer of Leeds Beckett University but is based in America he does some really good stuff I mentioned Leeds Beckett there's uh, Professor Kevin Till and his research group around you know the adolescent work particularly in rugby and, and, and football. There's, there's so many other, other people out there that are doing work in this area. I, I, I really think that there's, there's an army of people working on this because they've seen the, the benefits that it can have in a negative sense and we want to try and improve it. So I would definitely go to those people as the, as the standouts. Mm -hmm. So where can people find out more about you and about athlete discovery and about your research? So I'm on Twitter. Um, I, fi I, I find Twitter the best resource going um, for keeping up to date with things. Uh, so I'm on, I'm on Twitter as uh, jjay underscore Salter as my kind of um, academic one, if you like, or my, my professional one. And I've got Athlete Discov um, as the handle for the, the business one. So I kind of use them interchangeably for different things. Um, I'm on Instagram uh, with Athlete Discovery. And then my website for that is athletediscovery.co.uk. Um, it's a fairly low maintenance site. It just says what I do and you know ways of contacting me and things like that. But it has some pictures and a little bit more about me. And I usually put links to things like this on or any of my research from there. So that's it. But I definitely think Twitter's Twitter's the best place to be. Mm -hmm. It seems to be a really useful way of, of you know people obviously disseminating their research and it being really accessible and, and quick to be able to pick things up. It is, and, and, and I, I try and avoid going on it too much because every time you go on it, I bookmark about five things. <laughs> yeah. so it's, I, try, I try and limit how much I go on it because you can easily, I mentioned earlier about my, why my wife's watching programs on telly, I'm just there, and, and it's literally being absorbed by everything I'm trying to digest, and it's, it's overwhelming at times, but um, I think it's, 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 there's nothing that compares to it in terms of the currency and how quickly things move on there. Mm. Well, it's been brilliant to, to speak to you today, Jamie, and to pick your brain and hear about your research. I look forward to the, the next few bits and pieces coming out, and hopefully we can uh, start to put together some recommendations and some useful guidelines for coaches to help steer their, their athletes well in the future. But I really appreciate your time today, and thanks for coming on. You're welcome. Thank you very much for having me, Bob.